welcome to the World Circular Economy Forum. Hello and welcome to the World Circular Economy Forum. And for many, many years, I have helped out with the Zero Waste Conference in Vancouver, working with Metro and the municipalities to think about circularity and the circular economy. I am absolutely thrilled to be invited to participate in this conference, to be working with this guy for the next couple of days. Good morning, my name is Trupa Neville. I'm one of the founding directors of Future Ancestors Services, a young company led by a black and indigenous team trying to improve this country for the next generation of Canadian leaders. We work on uh, different ways, social justice, environment and equity, knowing that these are obstacles that uh, help prevent us from uh, improving our society. I often work in these change spheres and so I'm really uh, thrilled to be here with you and uh, to be moderating these uh, important discussions on circular economy. We're so thrilled to welcome you today to the fifth World Circular Economy Forum. You know, we had more than 8,000 people register from 160 countries on every single continent. So we're feeling it today. We're feeling this uh, possibility of bringing people together to have such an important conversation. And we want to start that in a good way. We are coming to you live from Toronto, Canada, and we acknowledge that the land that we're meeting on is the traditional territory of many nations, including the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Anishinaabe, the Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee, and the Wendat peoples. It's now home to many diverse First Nations and Inuit and Métis people. We also want to acknowledge that Toronto is covered by Treaty 13 with the Mississaugas of the Credit. Donc pour notre, notre public international, les reconnaissances de territoires sont adaptées d'une amalgamation des traditions pratiquées par plusieurs communautés autochtones depuis des temps immémoriaux en ce qu'on appelle le Canada aujourd'hui. Donc cependant pour plusieurs Canadiens et personnes non autochtones et pour notre public à l'international, l'idée de reconnaître un territoire ou la terre est un concept relativement nouveau. Donc en suivant les appels à l'action et les recommandations de la Commission de, de vérité et de réconciliation du Canada, les reconnaissances de territoires sont devenues une pratique habituelle avant le début d'un événement au Canada. We're very grateful to be able to share with you a special message from the chief of the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nations, Stacy Laform. Chief Laform was first elected chief in 1999. He's a storyteller, a poet, and a published author, also a celebrated leader across MCFN's treaty lands and territory. After that, we have the special pleasure of sharing a welcoming song that's performed by third-term band councillor Kathy Jameson. Miigwech to both of you, Chief Laform and Councillor Jameson. Ali, was you. Nagani and Nishnebeke Nidi. Stacey Laform, Disnikats. Credit Dinsura. Mainga Dota. Mississauga and Nishnebe Dao. We give thanks to the Creator. We offer our respect and love to our Mother the Earth. We acknowledge the world around us and understand our place within it. We acknowledge the many nations that walked this land in the past and the many who walk it today. We understand the importance of unity with each other and our planet. We acknowledge and offer our respect to the Mississaugas of the Anishinaabe, caretakers, treaty holders of these lands. And we challenge you, instead of thinking of climate change as a problem to be solved. Think of Mother Earth as a soul to be saved. Be safe, be heard, Lama Pete. Oh, hey, yeah. 
What a good way to get us started, thinking about um, taking care and saving the soul of Mother Earth, as opposed to thinking about climate as a problem to solve. Absolutely, and I think something that's really powerful in um, the, the videos we just heard, both in the song and in the welcoming by Chief Laforme, is really that importance of recognizing our responsibility to the land through our ancestors and through our ancestry. And so I encourage those of you who are in countries that may not have um, that may not have what we refer to as an indigenous population, to really sort of think about the cultures that grew up in um, in the land that you're on, and sort of the ways in which that culture has interacted with that land. I think that's going to really um, set us up for success as we start talking about circularity, the environment, which all inherently center the land, and is deeply connected mm -hmm. one thing to the next. Oh, absolutely. It really sort of highlights those weaves and those threads. And so to kick us off, as we have completed our land acknowledgement, um, we have a special performance by talented high school students and community members from Eskasoni First Nation on the land uh, also known as Cape Breton. The YouTube channel for the Allison Bernard Memorial High School Music Program get this, has over four and a half thousand followers. Their music teacher was awarded the 2020 Music Counts Music Teacher of the Year Juno Award, which is a big music award here in Canada. They've created waves in the music world by featuring Mi'kmaq lyrics and celebrating the language Unamaji and the culture and the community. Watch the chat for some important links to this if you want to find out more about the work that the kids are doing and the cultures that they represent. Alors, uh, installez-vous confortablement et prenez. Uh, so, sit back and take advantage of this uh, uh, little trip to beautiful uh, uh, Cape Breton and uh, the traditional Unamagi uh, territory.
nations believe that nothing follows a straight path. When you live in harmony with nature and with others, no path is true beginning or end. Instead, endings are new beginnings. Where everything has a place and purpose. Everything is connected. Everything is circular. First Nations believe that humans are the stewards of the earth. We believe that you should only take what you need from the land and always leave nature as you found it. We believe we should live today for the betterment of future generations. However, modern ways and linear thinking have allowed for our fragile connection with the earth and with each other to be easily broken. Oftentimes in ways that are not sustainable. And sometimes in ways that cannot be healed. Our ways must change today or the earth will soon no longer be able to provide for us or for the animals with which we share the land. Without a circular connection with the earth, man cannot thrive. And future generations will lose their connection to the land and stray from their paths in this world. My teachings of my ancestors constantly reminds me that no action that I take or every action that I take has to be in balance and harmony with our earth. And I believe that uh, if that if that's part of that wonderful idea or philosophy that we employed in a modern context, I don't think we would be in the state of mind, the state of being as we are now, in which I honestly and truly believe that through, this, through science and technology, we have literally exhausted the carrying capacity of the system. We even exhausted the cleansing capacity of the system. And the main economic model that we depend upon in the, in the education system is that we're always trying to be enlightened or educated how to become a, a number one exploiter. But this exploitation, I think, has gone too far, in which now I believe we have reached a point of no return. Unless now we spend some time together, not regionally, not nationally, but globally. We can no longer exploit nature and people for profit. We must begin to live today, not just for today, but for the future. This is our opportunity to come together and work together to find solutions. To find new ways to rebuild what has been lost. All the global people, all, all people, regional or national, have to come together and say, okay, how do we, how do we construct our economics to be much more, much, much, much more sus ecologically sustainable? The path forward is through unity, education, and truth ways and new, working together for the betterment of all people and all of nature. Take only what you need and live today for future generations. One with each other and one with the land. Lalio. You're in full compliment. Thank you. Merci beaucoup. Alison Bernard, First Nation. We're so. Merci pour l'école secondaire Bernard de Memorial. Et continuez si à travers le monde, si nous pouvons faire augmenter euh, les euh, personnes qui suivent ce groupe. Now, Ms. Christine Hogan. Uh, Deputy Minister for the Environment, for some welcoming remarks. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the World Circular Economy Forum 2021, the fifth edition of its kind. 
First, let me thank Chief Laforme and Councillor Jameson from the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation for their blessing and song. And thank you to the students of Allison Bernard Memorial High School, their teacher, Carter Chasson, and Elder Albert Marshall for their beautiful and thoughtful opening to the forum. And thank you all for joining us today. Merci à tous de votre participation. Thank you all of you for being with us today. I am very happy to be speaking to you this morning from Ottawa, which is on the traditional and unceded territory of the Anishinaabe uh, Nation. Hosting this year's forum, which is co-organized with the Finnish Innovation Fund, Citra. We're proud to be the first North American host of the World Circular Economy Forum. Cet événement rassemble une communauté internationale. This uh, event uh, gathers together the international community of business leaders, deciders, experts, participants who have solutions in the area of circular economy with a view to contributing to accelerating the world transition towards this type of economy. Is game changers, seizing the circular opportunity. The forum will focus on the actions needed in the next five years to raise circular ambition globally, to bring in new allies and to introduce new voices to the conversation. Qu'il s'agisse des gouvernements, de l'industrie, des travailleurs ou des consommateurs. Uh, whether it be governments, industry, workers, consumers, we all have to work to build a cleaner, greener and more prosperous world for all. We need game changers. With your participation, you're helping in this transition. So thank you again for being here. We wish all participants productive discussions. Thank you. Merci beaucoup. Thank you very much. Minister Hogan. Up next, we'd like to welcome Associate Deputy Minister of Environment and Climate Change Canada, Paul Haluka, and also Toronto City Councillor Jennifer McKelvey. She's going to be joining us from our second stage. Our co-host of the WCEF 2021, Citra's President, Jyrki Katainen, also joining us, but this time from our sister studio in Finland. Thank you, Chuck and Catherine. Yerky, we're sorry we, uh, we, could, we could not host you here and all the WCEF 2021 participants here in beautiful Toronto and beautiful Canada. But I know this year's forum comes at a key moment in our journey towards a prosperous, inclusive and equitable circular economy. This is the fifth WCEF and what we have accomplished in these past five years is remarkable. Yerky, I'll start with a question for you. What do you hope uh, to accomplish over the next three days and beyond? and the nature is uh, becoming very powerful. But to your question, since 2017, WCF has evolved and quickly become one of the largest circular economy events and collaboration processes in the world. I see that this also reflects the role of the message of the importance of a circular uh, economy spreading. In the last five years, WCF has supported in framing the urgency and credibility of circular economy solutions, as well as its complexity. The transition is happening on all levels, but I must say that the systemic change to a fully circular economy is still waiting to happen in Finland and globally. At CITRA, we are very excited to be co-hosting the first ever WCF in North America. During the next three days, I hope that WCF will inspire and connect businesses, decision makers, investors and others to take leadership in the circular transition all around the globe. There is no denying that a lot of work lies ahead. Our current climate actions are not enough to reach the 1.5 degree target and 90% of biodiversity loss is caused by the way we extract and process materials. As the punchline of WCF 2021 says, now is the time to change the game. A clear accomplishment of WCF lies actually in its active and devoted partner network. WCF is a big effort of numerous partner organizations. 
The Game Changer and Demonstration sessions today and tomorrow will cover on multiple aspects of a circular transition. On Wednesday, our partners offer you a large variety of accelerator sessions. So check out the program for the third day, whether you are interested in industry transition, data sharing or regional uh, circular efforts from around the globe or some other of the 23 different angles presented. So I'm very optimistic that again this year's WCF will inspire many and it will push circular economy forward. Thank you, Yerke. I look forward to meeting you in person at some point. Uh, it sounds like we have a very exciting three days ahead of us, and, and it begins with uh, Jennifer, Councillor uh, McKelvey. Uh, welcome to the WCEF 2021 uh, Toronto studio. Tron Toronto is, as we know, Canada's largest city and a leader in circularity. What role can cities play in accelerating, accelerating the transition to a circular economy? Well, firstly, thank you so much for the opportunity to be here. It's very nice to meet you, Paul. Nice it's very nice to meet you, Yerke, over there in Finland. <laughs> and a very big welcome on behalf of Mayor John Tory for all of you that are joining us virtually today. Um, as you said, cities have an enormous ability to make a big impact. And a really good example of that was in 2019, when Toronto, alongside 800 municipalities, signed on to the Climate Emergency Declaration. And we recognized that we needed to be net zero by 2050 or sooner. And certainly, Toronto, uh, recognizes that as Canada's largest municipality, we have to be a leader. It's an important role for us to play. And we are charting an ambitious course to be net zero by 2050 or sooner. We've also hit our goal for 2020 of a 30% reduction of greenhouse gas emissions from 1990 levels. And now we're currently 37% less of that. But of course, that goes hand in hand with the circular economy. And Toronto wants to be the first city in the province of Ontario to have a circular economy. And we're doing that with three important ways. The first is that we've dedicated the resources to get there. Our solid waste management staff, who are absolutely wonderful at the City of Toronto, have a dedicated unit, the Circular Economy Unit, that is Innovation Unit, which is working on this. We've also dedicated the resources and we're transforming the way we manage our waste. We have three boxes outside of our homes, one for recycling, one for that dreaded garbage that we still don't have a way to get rid of yet, and the organics, uh, the organics box as well. And that's our green bins. And importantly, it's been raccoon tested because we have those nasty little critters that like to get into our garbage. And we are taking that waste, we are bringing it to an organics processing facility. It's undergoing anaerobic digestion, something I love to nurture talk about because I used to be an environmental scientist and we're producing renewable natural gas and that is being fed onto the grid and it's decreasing our reliance on fossil fuels. So these these measures are helping to get started on this path towards a circular economy unit and of course we know we need to have partnerships with that and that's why we're developing our roadmap for partnerships and that involves working with private organizations, nonprofits, community groups, other municipalities, great organizations like yours at Environment Canada and of course the international community. So we're just so very excited to invite all of you here today virtually to Toronto. I look forward to us developing those partnerships together. Now, of course, I wouldn't be a good politician. I said I used to be a scientist, but I became a politician unless I gave a shout out to the people of Toronto. So I just want to share with you maybe a couple things that our citizens are doing because they're really at the forefront of this transition to the circular economy. So in addition to those in the homes that are sorting their waste very meticulously into those boxes, in my home community of Scarborough Rouge Park, we have a building called Mayfair in the Green. It's an apartment building. It's older. All of the garbage used to go into one garbage chute. But the residents of this building have come together to say we need to do better. They are putting their green organics into the garbage chute. They are then walking down and pre-sorting all of their recyclables, all of their garbage for that nasty stream we still need to get rid of, but they're really playing an important part of that. And the last example I'll give you is Women for Climate. Toronto signed on for Women for Climate, a great international program to help women develop their ideas, to bring them through to execution. And I was just totally excited that many of those participants, their ideas were around the circular economy and waste reduction. Citizens are coming up with this on their own as well. The winner, I'll give a shout out to her, Hilary Scanlon. She's developing a new technology, it's tactile, to put on those garbage bins 
bins that we have outside so that she can tactily, you can tell where does your garbage go, where does your green go, where does your recycling go, so that uh, those that are visually impaired can also contribute to this as well. So we have wonderful people doing great things in Toronto, our city staff, our citizens all working together and I just I'm so excited by this conference that we can find ways to work together with the international community. Thank you again for the opportunity to be here. Thank you, Jennifer, and thanks for highlighting uh, a tremendous vision and leadership from Toronto. And, and I agree, shout out to Hillary. That sounds like a tremendous innovation. So uh, thank you, Jennifer. Thank you, Yerke. We will say goodbye for now, and we will look forward to seeing you both again soon. Thank you. Welcome to Expanding the Circle. Now we're going to talk about collaborative leadership to drive bold action. For those of you just joining, my name is Catherine Gretzinger. I am uh, uh, Chuck Odenibo. Uh, this is a, uh, uh, an important initiative to, to have a, a collective and bold actions uh, for the circular economy. I mean, uh, uh, I'm eager to hear everything that uh, our speakers will have to, to say. We've heard uh, uh, Jennifer talk about, uh, Heather talk about uh, uh, Toronto, and we know there are things, uh, uh, very wonderful things that are happening in other cities, uh, Montreal and mm, Thank you, Chuck. Um, She's going to give a keynote address on circular economy leadership for global commons. Dr. Ishii is the director of the Center for Global Commons, whose mission it is to catalyze systems of change so that humans can achieve sustainable development within planetary boundaries. Welcome to the World Circular Economy Forum 2021. Let us first reflect where we are in the history of humanity. For so long, we considered the mother earth to be very powerful and her capacity to be limitless. We thought we can do whatever we want to and completely forgot that our current economic development has been supported by the resilient and the stable Earth system, that is our global commons. The inconvenient truth is that we have already pushed the carrying capacity of the Earth system to its breaking point. Climate change, extreme weather events, biodiversity loss, pollution in the air, land and water, all point to this fact. Scientists have long alerted that we were approaching or already exceeding several planetary boundaries. Geologists are telling us that we have already left the Holocene where we enjoyed the stable Earth system and have entered the Anthropocene uncharted sea. The latest IPCC assessment report implied that we have only 10 years left to change the course if we want to have a prosperous, sustainable, fair, inclusive future for all. But what can we do in the next 10 years? The fundamental solution is to transform the current economic system we need to decarbonize the energy system essentially in one generation. We need to make our food system much more sustainable and we need to make our cities much smarter. On top of all of this, we need to change our production and consumption system or our current way of life, which is very linear. Take, make waste, to a circular economy. Moving to the circular economy provides the best way to transform the current economic system. What's more, 
moving to a circular economy uh, provides a solution to the planetary level problem, but also it presents a new economic model. It reduces loss and stress from competition for limited resources and presents a new economic opportunity. It provides a business opportunity almost all areas in the economy. But let us take a moment and ask, are we making sufficient progress in increasing the circularity? The answer would be not exactly what we want to celebrate. The recent circular gap report tells us that only 9% of the natural resources we have taken from the earth are returned to the production cycle, while the remaining 90% are either landfilled, burnt, or dampened in the ocean. And it is despite the, all the excitement or the enthusiasm about circular economy in the past. Maybe we should ask ourselves why we have not been able to make a significant dent. Where we are stuck, what are the stumbling blocks, and what kind of extra and concrete efforts we need to make a significant breakthrough to system change. One very unique aspect of the circular economy is that it is subject to the system stalemate. We need to dismantle the deadlock of the old system which in turn requires leadership from government, business, and citizens all exercised simultaneously. And that is why we are here today. Moving to the circular economy simultaneously requires multiple actions on the various fronts. We need to identify game-changing solutions we need to bring new allies and voices and youth to the table. We need to support emerging coalitions. And we need to raise ambition locally, regionally, and globally. It's time for leaders to come together and break silos and challenge the harmful policies and practices from the old system, we need to design and present the new economic model with circularity. We need to make the circular economy everybody's business. And that is the only way to safeguard the global commons and to ensure sustainable, transparent, fair, and prosperous society for all. Thank you so much. Arigato gozaimasu, Ishi Sensei. Merci beaucoup. So this morning, j'ai le plaisir de. I'm happy to welcome Erin Andrews and Dakota Norris. And we need to see in the next five years. Good morning, bon matin to the both of you. Good morning, Chuck. Good morning, Dakota. Good morning to both of you. Donc, it is a, such a pleasure to have all of, all of you here. As young people in what is currently Canada, as people under 30, these are important conversations that we often have uh, with our peers, and now we are having it on an international stage. So um, I ask the international audience to listen, pay attention, and uh, let's get started. Dakota, I will ask you to start us off. So circular economy may be, new in, uh, may be a new term here in North America, but the idea is not a new idea. As a Gwich'in First Nation youth who sits on Canada's Sustainable Development Council with me, um, I have a double question for you. The first being, what can we learn from Indigenous knowledge and wisdom as we look to build a more circular world? And the second, how can we unify and amplify efforts across movements? Dakota, please. Excellent questions. Thank you very much and happy to be here. Um, 
in response, I'll start by saying we know that circularity and interconnectedness is an inherent feature of many Indigenous peoples' uh, worldview within not just economic but also their social and environmental realms. So in my work examining economic development in Indigenous communities, especially here in Saskatchewan, the Canadian province I'm calling in from, this is a central theme. Many modern indigenous cultures directly descend from and still reflect a traditional hunter-gatherer society that places high value on reciprocity and redistribution and relationships dating back uh, as far as 11,000 years here in Saskatchewan. And the modern economy in these areas also reflects this type of society where these values still play a significant role in the day-to-day -day lives of a large population of indigenous communities. These circular and interconnected economic activities are based strongly in relationships and they include everything like buying and uh, selling, trading, giving things away, giving away goods and services in all kinds of different uh, markets and industries. And it's a part of daily life for many people. So I think a way of amplifying this is through things like technology or like uh, social media, like Facebook, that allow these people to unify and amplify these ways of living and their, the values that they already have. These indigenous communities are able to live by their values to a greater extent because it becomes so much easier and quicker and you can um, reach these ideas into larger markets. You could even set up your own rules and regulations and governance structures online, which in effect allows these indigenous communities to create their own niche markets that serve their own values. So I think that's an excellent way of amplifying and allowing these sustainable economic activities to persist. What I know is that humanity needs a shift in their values and our actions to reignite our relationship with ourselves, with each other, and with the natural world. And the traditions and the knowledge for doing so, they, they actually already exist at our doorstep. So I think before we try to reinvent the wheel, let's seek the inspiration and guidance that we can get from Indigenous peoples and from traditional societies, not just for their input, but to actually understand these very rich and very diverse ways of uh, viewing the world. So I think let's unify our ways of living and amplify the ways that already intrinsically embody circular economy values in uh, Indigenous societies as well as traditional ones. Amazing. Thank you so much for sharing, Dakota. Um, it's really interesting because a recent report released by Park People um, stated that in, in Canada, uh, lands that are currently sort of managed by Indigenous peoples demonstrate 40% greater biodiversity. And internationally, we know that 80% of biodiversity is safeguarded by Indigenous populations. So really sort of highlighting that key piece of centering and recognizing Indigenous knowledge and not necessarily having to try and rebuild the will. Um, Aaron, um, as a settler, as a non-Indigenous Canadian, uh, you are the executive director and founder of Impact Zero, a non-profit organization working to build Toronto's circular economy alongside entrepreneurs and conscious consumers. So we are on your home turf. Hi. Uh, so tell us, why did you start Impact Zero? And what have your experiences been in mobilizing for grassroots circular change? What are some of the biggest challenges you faced and what are the biggest challenges that entrepreneurs that you work with, what are the challenges that they face as well in sort of trying to adapt um, a uh, circular economy lifestyle or uh, business model? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so what, what we learned and the reason why I've started Impact Zero is because there's so much untapped passion in communities around the city and around Canada. So similar to what Dakota was saying, we don't need to go off and like build our own infrastructure or build something brand new. It's more about listening to the communities, whether that's indigenous communities or other communities that need specific culturally appropriate solutions. And we essentially target resources towards their ideas. So we have an accelerator program we do a lot of education to inform and empower people to take action on these solutions. So we have less of that imposter syndrome and you know not or being afraid to take that leadership position and start something that you see is a gap. And we really try to just really amplify the work that will already be done. Um, and so what's a big barrier though for us is definitely resources. Mm -hmm. So as mostly youth honestly and other communities and people who are doing this as a volunteer role on the side of something else, 
else. It's unfortunate that it doesn't seem like this labor is taken as value and people will happily take it as a volunteer position. So that's why we really try to link it up with business solutions. Um, and so if there are governments or co corporations that want to support the circular economy, then my response is often to then support these types of grassroots initiatives that are happening on the ground and target your financial resources, target your human resources to supporting these groups that are already doing amazing work and just amplify it, expand it, and basically help it scale faster to build this whole new economy that we keep talking about. Amazing. So what I'm sort of hearing from both you and Dakota is the importance of listening to people, listening to communities, listening to the people on the ground who are living their day-to-day -day lives and what are their needs, what are their wants, how can we support, and not necessarily how can we come in with our ideas and help, but how can we support, elevate their ideas and really sort of build a new economy that centers uh, people and their interactions with nature. Yeah. Thank you for that. So in a few minutes, we'll actually be joined by circular economy uh, leaders from all around the world to discuss the leadership needed to build momentum, strengthen capacity, and support emerging partnerships. The theme of our forum is Game Changers, and we are focusing on the next five years. From both of your perspectives, where do we need to be in five years, and what will it take for us to get there? Dakota, I'm going to hand it off to you first. Absolutely, thank you. I think a lot of what I have to say reflects a lot of um, the points that were just made. I know Indigenous peoples in their worldview have a lot to offer in achieving a more circular economy. And as I said, in some ways, we see that uh, what is new in the circular economy is um, an old concept for these Indigenous peoples. So, and while these people are trying to develop their nations and improve their socioeconomic circumstances, um, What's important is that this participation in the global economy is done on their own terms in ways that recognize and strengthen their culture and their values, which is why I'm really excited about the old meeting the new because it means we can strengthen all of these communities um, while also developing the circular economy. However, a major challenge to this is that Indigenous knowledge and rights aren't fully recognized or at least acted upon in many regions. And doing so is what will allow us to understand and embrace and sustain these ways of life, uh, which have so much to offer us. So for governments, not only adopting, uh, but also implementing the 2007 United Nations Declaration on the Rights for Indigenous People, uh, Indigenous Peoples, as soon as possible is probably the best way to begin. And in five years, I hope that we're all uh, well underway to actually uh, implementing that in a good way. We know in Canada that Indigenous people, especially youth, are the fastest growing demographic in the country, that their businesses are among the most innovative. For every dollar invested in Indigenous businesses, over $3 is added to our GDP. Uh, and despite this, a lot of financing and business programs and resources for Indigenous peoples actually go unused, uh, despite the, the massive need and demand for Indigenous businesses. Um, so to me, this points to a need to better connect with communities and really understand their needs and meeting them where they are, as was uh, just iterated. Uh, so I think that's something that could be done at a more local level to help build uh, culturally appropriate resources and infrastructure to help people uh, achieve their um, participation in the circular economy. And in five years, I hope that we have globally recognized the importance of Indigenous and traditional societies and their values, meet them where they are, understand their worldviews, uh, reconcile any rights or justice issues preventing them from flourishing in the economy, and that those people have an opportunity to participate in and shape the circular economy on their own terms, which it's a lot, uh, I know, but five years is a long time. And I know we're well underway already. Thank you for that. Erin, I'm not going to hand it off to you. Yeah. So. In the next five years, that's a really big timeline, right? Five years is pretty far away. So I typically ask people that we start to think a little bit sooner and maybe um, start thinking about what we can do today that would put us in a really great position to actually see the circular economy in action in five years. And so part of that is exactly what Dakota mentioned, listening to communities, making these things happen on the ground. Um, because I want to actually give you one example. So there was one project that we worked with. It's called CASE. 
um, and they essentially collect black plastic containers, wash them, and resell them back to restaurants. And so these things, we can do it today. We had to pilot, and obviously it took a lot of time to learn how to actually make this work, but she's diverted 50,000 containers since May. Right, like this, this stuff can happen, and it's really impressive as long as we have the resources to help these people do this very important work and move it forward faster. Whether that's in the business sense or even a community initiative, like some community gardens or other like local mutual aid situations that can like help the um, residents of a given community actually better themselves today. So we're ready in five years to take on the circular economy in full fruition. Amazing. Let's uh, now invite some of the older than 30s to join our conversation. <laughs> Welcome back, Catherine. I'm excited for our discussion. Thank you so much, Duke Smarty Pants. Um, I'm not that old yet, um, but I was just feeling really inspired listening to Dakota and to you. Uh, these ideas about the nowness of the issues that we face and the fact that w the wisdom is all around us if we just start listening, as you suggested. Tuk. So just so wonderful to have you centered in this conversation that we're having today and just thrilled to be here to be a small part of it. I'd like to introduce now a roster of some impressive circular economy leaders. They're going to be joining us virtually and you're going to have an opportunity to interact with some of these folks who are real leaders in this space and they'll be looking to you for guidance and, and leadership too. So very much looking forward to this session. So our first guest is Dr. Jean Dar. Mujahoreya from Rwanda, the Rwandan Minister of Environment. Next up will be Nicholas Galarza, the Vice Minister of Environment for the Republic of Colombia, and then Isabella Teixeira, the co-chair of the International Resource Panel, and Leslie Johnson, the CEO of the Laudes Foundation. Welcome to you all. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay. Okay, fantastic. So thank you, Catherine, for introducing um, everyone. So just to give a quick summary of the conversation that we just had um, as, a, as a sort of mini group, um, Dakota and Aaron were sharing some of their thoughts on what is needed in order to force a transition into a circular economy in the next five years. And so a lot of what Dakota and Aaron said centered around the idea of really listening to communities, really listening to people, really going at that grassroots level um, interacting with the people with the various cultures that are interacting with that nature, uh, with the with the nature, with the environment, and centering them and um, allowing the voices to shine, allowing the ideas to take root. We heard Dakota talk about how indigenous businesses in what is currently Canada are, you know, for every dollar invested, get gain, give three dollars back to the economy. Erin gave an, a phenomenal example of someone locally in Toronto who is diverting waste away from landfills by simply rewashing uh, takeout containers that are used, which is which is such a simple, small task. It's so incredibly important. And so the conversation really centers around the idea of understanding that, that five years is a long time and there's a lot we can do. And so uh, Minister Mujamawaria and, Minister, and Vice Minister Galarza, um, we'll be starting with the both of you. So you are both part of important regional efforts to accelerate circular economy. Tell us about phenomenal circular startups and community initiatives in your region that are started by the people in the countries and the regions that you represent, um, including, or in fact, maybe especially those led by young people. So, Dr. Mujamawria, uh, je vous cède la parole. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, good afternoon, good evening. Uh, uh, for the leadership needed, there is a need, of course, to. Uh, there is a need of leaders who are game changer and who are able to accelerate the transition to a prosperous, inclusive, and equitable circular economy. These are policymakers, businesses, civil society, and other circular change makers who can pursue to unlock transformational change at the system level. Of course, we, we can unify effort. There is a need to strengthen collaboration through national 
regional, as you are saying, we are regional leaders and the global sacral economy platform. Uh, for example, National Sacro Economy Forum, Africa Sacro Economy Forum. And as my predecessor said, where do we need to be in five years? And what we take to, to get us there? There is a need for member government and organizations to develop sacro economy roadmaps that will define the direction. For example, Rwanda is in the process of developing sacro economy action plan that will define the required steps and compare key stakeholders' views on the essential changes and actions required for the sacro transformation and establish concrete and ambitious actions leading to tangible results of reduced environmental pollution, increased investment, and more effective circular economy financing mechanisms. We have to transform ambitions into action. This will be possible through integrating sacro economy actions into national and regional action plans. I thank you. Phenomenal. Mr. Vice Minister Galarza? Yes. Uh, I'm delighted to be here and I greet everyone in whichever time zone they are. Uh, I really like the way the question is framed because a lot of time uh, startups and communities do not have the reach uh, and the uh, amplification that they need and this allows us precisely to do that. Let me introduce um, the question by highlighting the fact that we at the Colombian uh, government knew from uh, the very beginning that we could not uh, lead a circular economy effort by ourselves in the national or the federal government. And for that reason, the participation of different stakeholders, uh, businesses, the academia, civil society, and, and individuals in general, um, needed to be part and uh, for that reason we held different forums focus groups validation meetings that gave us very important uh, feedback for us to put together the national circular economy strategy that was uh, launched and published on 20, 2019 and they have been again instrumental on the implementation of the strategy we've had roughly 25 regional circular meeting uh, roundtables um, as key spaces to uh, identify important initiatives that need to increase their reach and that need to be scaled up. And for that reason, right now we have about 120 uh, initiatives that are inspired by communities' interest and are uh, by our youth that um, highlight the importance of valuing waste, reducing our carbon footprint, and to promoting lifestyles. In terms of the specifics, I'd like to highlight, highlight an initiative called uh, EatCloud, which is a food surplus management model that reduces waste, fights hunger, and helps the environment, kind of a triple end approach that it's very aligned with the type of initiatives that we should develop as in, in, in a time of climate crisis. And what they do is connect the food industry with uh, large surface supermarkets, restaurants, hotels, and agricultural producers with food banks and foundations that are serving the poor, those in need. And then they bridge the gap between food that cannot be sold and normally would be wasted and those that need it uh, the most. They have a digital platform that mediates supply and demand and connects surplus, food surpluses in a timely fashion 
uh, and, and that is very, very important. They are right now in 230 Colombian cities uh, and they have managed to serve uh, over 1,800 donation points and 2,000 foundations, 22 food banks all over the world, all, all over the, the country, sorry, uh, recovering over 14,000 tons of food, which uh, equate to uh, 32 million food plates served, also mitigating roughly 500 tons of CO2. And on the same token, we have Mercaviva, which is the marketing channel of Siembra Viva, a company that supports small farmers implementing regenerative um, organic agriculture, connecting them with a market without going to wholesalers and intermediaries, that allowing them to get a larger share of the profit. The product arrives to supermarkets directly from the producers or even to homes of those that directly uh, um, purchase from the Mercaviva.com website. Uh, reg regenerative, regenerative agriculture, sorry, uh, is very important in the uh, fight for climate change. We do know that the Afolo sector contributes significantly to uh, the emission globally of uh, greenhouse gas emissions. And with the orchards and the networks of associated producers, they have managed to capture over 50 uh, tons of carbon footprint this year alone on the, uh, on the 10 uh, months roughly, or nine months that we have. And they are producing also healthy food, roughly 240 tons of vegetables per year. So this, uh, it's been possible to impact the economy possibly, contributing to reactivation in, in a post-pandemic um, scenario. And it is important to note that we don't only work with uh, promoting the work of these type of initiatives, but also we've been working with other companies such as Nestlé, Avina, Coca-Cola, and Pepsi, Avon, among others, who have focused policies to transition to circular economy, in some cases to plastic neutrality in their value chains. Thank you so much, Vice Minister, for so many specific uh, details and arrangements, and to Minister as well for such an amazing um, visioning of what is going to be happening in Rwanda. I'm now going to turn to Ms. Johnston. You run the Laudes Foundation, which works through industry to, and I'll quote you here, redefine value for the good of all. How would doing so address some of the issues that we're talking about today, Ms. Johnson? How specifically would having that kind of intention change things? Great. Thanks, Catherine, and thank you for the invitation to be here today. So I heard a lot of things this morning, and, you know, from the, the need to collaborate uh, amongst unlikely allies to the importance of getting multiple voices into the solution to the fact that the concept of circular economy isn't new. We heard from Dakota on the deep values and core beliefs of Indigenous communities. Um, so all this is very much inspiring and food for thought. And I would like to also call out when Dr. Ishii said, you know, there's a lot of urgency to act. Uh, we have less than 10 years to act, to collaborate, and to transform the current economic system. So that's what I want to focus on in answer to your question about what do we mean when we talk about value? Because this session in this forum, in fact, is called the game changing sessions. Um, however, what's this game that we're trying to change? And this game is the very global economic system that we as humans created. And granted, this is a system that based on neoliberal capitalism has created a lot of wealth and it has unleashed a lot of creativity and innovation, but it's also a system as we know that's not valuing what we should value the most, people and planet. And we saw the sentiment being echoed very loudly in the chat uh, in the opening sessions. So when we at Laudas Foundation talk about redefining value for the good of all, we're working to put into practice the enablers and the elements of a circular economy, one that is restorative, that is regenerative, and that is fair and just. 
And how do we do this? So this is where I think I'm the only representative here from philanthropy on this panel, um, but this is where I put on my philanthropy hat because I really do want to urge other funders that may be listening to this to step up. Because while funding from philanthropy is minuscule compared to funding from the private and public sectors, philanthropic funding is a very unique and exciting type of support. Why? Because it can take risks, it can think long term, it can support the enablers of a circular economy. You know, we can ensure that people, and here I mean all people, with a very deep gender equity and inclusion lens are at the heart of a circular economy. And we don't have to worry about making a profit or getting reelected. So we can fail. So even when philanthropy fails, that means we learn and hopefully we get better next time. But I'm not here to talk about failing. I'm here to talk about how can we change that game? Because to me, to change the game, we need to inspire and challenge business and industry to move, to move faster. And to, the, to do that, we need bold and brave leadership. So at Loudest, we're doing that in several ways. And I'll just give a couple examples because I know we don't have much time. One way is that we are demonstrating that circular models can work. And sometimes it's hard to demonstrate because if you haven't tried something, it's a high risk to try it. So we've, we're doing this in partnership with many partners, one of which is Canopy that is partnered with companies like Lensing and Sodra, essentially to take waste, textile waste, and convert it into cellulosic fiber instead of using virgin materials. So that's a technical demonstration, but one that needs a push from philanthropic support. We're also doing this by supporting platforms that can help business and government to move faster. So one example of such platforms is the Carbon Neutral Cities Alliance, which effectively is working to promote low carbon and circular building materials across Europe. And by chance, the program that we're funding is called the Game Changers Fund. So I think that's a very common vocabulary for trying to change a system. And we also support platforms like PACE, the platform for accelerating the circular economy, that's really trying to bring together diverse stakeholders to work in lockstep with each other. And finally, we're really trying to change the game. Uh, we are partnering with many organizations that are either trying to redefine how we see value to determine what that new economy could look like. And one partnership I'm really excited about is that with the Club of Rome, where we're supporting an initiative called Earth for All that's effectively bringing together leading thinkers and public sector leaders to really define those pathways we need to take, those transformational pathways so that we can transform, say, the energy system, or we can bring circularity into, say, the food system. So that's a piece of thinking and a piece of work that needed a little bit of support from philanthropy to get going. And by doing that and supporting these types of initiatives, we as a foundation are ensuring that we put value on what matters most. People, and again, I mean all people, and the one precious earth that I know we all love and want to protect. Thank you. Ms. Johnston, thank you so much. It's incredible how many echoes there are between each of your voices, and I'm looking forward now to hearing from Ms. Tishera. Um, what is an example that you can offer us of how circularity can actually unify some of these efforts that are happening locally and also globally? Ms. Tishera. Thank you very much uh, for this opportunity to share some ideas here or share new perspectives considering science and the political and economic world. As uh, my friend Naoko, uh, Professor Aishi, made clear before, uh, we humanity, humanity must reconnect with nature. And this means, as all the panel members make reference before, that uh, we need to understand our limits. And, uh, and to understand our limits, we need to understand our role and our ambition to promote a class of sustainable development in this century. And this must be based not on, on the past, but considering what is coming if you have this climate age and also the technological and digital age that you, you mark, you'll be between these two ages that we live this century. So for this, we need to change and be together to change. Okay, and so we need new tracks and pathways, as mentioned before, uh, that can bring us together, but considering the local needs and national interests to promote inclusive and sustainable development, and also considering environment, global environmental crisis and limits of the nature. Circularity means it's be transformed and ambitions to promote a carbonized world. 
but we need to connect agendas and people. So consider your question. I do believe that our report of international report, international resource panel demonstrate that circularity was the most efficient solutions across global environmental problems. Why? Because you, because national resource efficient bridge the things, promote bridge to connect issues and to be more efficient and more permanent with our answers and all our solutions. How climate change and biodiversity come together. This is a clear example of how uh, circularity should play or must play, because nature, 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 and science should come together to say that circularity must be seen as a nature-based solution to biodiversity. So protection. We can use resource efficient agenda as a critical to tackle the nature and climate ambition. We need to go into the NDCs, international interest, to address concretely how circularity must come to promote solutions, not only to face, to cut, to cut emissions, but also to protect biodiverse loss and also to avoid biodiverse loss and also water scarcity. We know based on the science that you need to change, but you know also that you need to promote innovative ways based on the solution to convince people to come together. If you're not able to manage this in different levels, if not able to make concrete reaction like promote job generations, it would be very difficult to put together different global crises like climate change, biodiversity law, and the pollution and degradation ecosystem. If you're looking for to address also social inequalities and economic informality. We are discussing here new business economic model, great, but we need to understand how we can avoid additional inequalities in these solutions. This means that we need to understand what must stay behind what we need to avoid to transfer to the center, and what we are, how we come together. For example, is a good example of, of indigenous people, how we come together to share values based on our beliefs and based on our reality. This is why circularity is very important, because we have flexibility. We have different initiatives, different alternatives to bring circularity together. Since food production, also energy production, also new uh, uh, civil construction and building and deal uh, the, the, the gaps of housing in developing economies, for example, or also in smart cities. So, circular economy comes together with circular bioeconomy. Don't forget it, and this is something very important to be preserved. Thank you. Thank you so much. It's just wonderful to, to listen to this plain language. We're really talking to each other, getting real about it, and also having passion show up and um, be part of this, because making this a human conversation is so necessary. Vice Minister Galarza and Minister Mudua Marare, um, I would love you to both touch on what's the best way to strengthen the capacity of governments to implement circular economy approaches. And let's go to Rwanda first. Thank you very much, Kevin. Uh, so on this question on what has been experienced in terms of strengthening the capacity of individual government to implement circular economy approach, moving toward a sacro, uh, moving toward a sacro system is an opportunity for rethinking production and consumption patterns, improving environmental quality and resource efficiency, creating new business models, promoting citizens and business acceptance, and awareness on the sacro economy through awareness change and boosting innovation. This requires the government to provide the policy succession and legal framework to foster investment in the sacro economy. Government need to identify existing small innovative initiatives and invest in them and connect local businesses to global leaders so they can access the best technology at the latest insight. We must also engage academia and the research community to identify cycle economy quick wins and priority areas 
based on the continent needs and circumstances. We also need to work with businesses to encourage the adoption of sacro economy principles all the way from the product design phase to product as a service and return scheme. Let me know if that answer your question and I'm more happy to add on. Thank you. Thank you so much, Minister, and so good to have you with us today. Let's go to Colombia now for a word on this, and then we'll bring our other panelists to the table, and we're going to be sure to include time for our youth members to have their thoughts and connect with you as well. Minister Galarza. Sure. So I guess something that is at the core of the leadership of the government is precisely the high-level commitment that we need to have. It must be guaranteed that the agenda of circular economy is part of the broader state agenda. For that reason, President Duque uh, made the mandate at the very beginning of the government to include circular economy as part of the government plan for his four-year uh, term. And as a byproduct of that, we ended up building the national strategy for circular economy that I did mention on the last goal, and that on top of having this strategy and on top of having the agenda, allows us to have key performance indicators and different mechanisms for follow-up and um, establishing the road to accomplish the different goals that were establishing that. Circular economy has also been included as a key component on both the mid-term and the long-term strategies for uh, climate action in Colombia. We recently updated our NDC, a National Determined Contribution, and we set up a very high ambition to reducing 51% of the greenhouse emission uh, greenhouse emissions of, of Colombia. And we have also included the uh, circular economy. Uh, as part of our carbon neutrality uh, agenda. Colombia has committed to become uh, carbon neutral by 2050. And uh, on, on the macro level, we have managed to include that. At a more local level, we need uh, governance mechanisms. And I was mentioning in the previous question also, the uh, creation of 21 regional uh, circular economy uh, boards and we have also created a joint technical sustainability committee as a high level stance for directing and monitoring uh, the efforts. And we have also included the circular economy strategy into the national system on competitiveness and innovation. And for that experience, we can of course conclude that a participation of different stakeholders is paramount. Uh, uh, of paramount importance as uh, a mechanism to strengthen the democratic process and to have uh, or to decrease the resistance to change that normally emerges in these type of initiatives that require uh, technology transition and so on. Okay. Uh, Thank you, Vice Minister. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pause you there just so that we have time to, to hear from other, our other guests as well. Thank you so much. Ms. Johnson, um, I know you've been listening intently here. I'm watching your head and watching your eyes. Um, you mentioned a couple of initiatives a few moments ago. Are there new initiatives for adopting circularity as a tool that you're looking to to sort of nudge us toward these new objectives and targets that people are starting to set? Thank you. Yeah, there's there's so much I could say, but I will focus on one because I, I, I love this concept of, of new allies that came up a couple times because I think that it speaks very much to the strategy that we developed at Laudas Foundation that if you really want to change a system, you need to engage, support, um, strengthen and bring together key actors who are going to make that change. Um, and we had identified four actors, government, investors, business and workers. Um, who should be leaders and key agents of change. And when I think about what are the mechanisms by which you can bring these allies together, there's one partner of ours that I think has a really great 
approach. And this is a partner that sits under UCL. Um, it's the Institute for Innovation and Public Purpose. And essentially what they do is, you know, given these big, hairy, audacious challenges that we're trying to tackle, whether it's climate breakdown or deepening inequality and inequity, um, or even this you know, continuous pandemic we find ourselves in, they take a mission approach. Um, because a mission approach is something that when you're looking at these you know, big challenges, which are complex and shifting and difficult and hard to get your head around, IIPP breaks down these challenges and this complexity by creating these missions which have concrete targets that that is very clear that we can act and, and achieve, but also a frame that will enable us to you know, put parameters around the challenge, the challenge itself and also spur innovation to try to come up with new solutions. So what's important about the mission approach, and you can kind of think of the mission to go to the moon, like that's sort of the, the what they're, they're referring back to, is it really is purpose-driven. Um, and I think the vice minister said something about mechanisms where you involve people through different mechanisms to get that voice in. The mission approach involves all key stakeholders, and it incorporates from the beginning not only their voices, but also um, the circular economy principles. And you're seeing that being rolled out in cities like Manchester um, in real time, where you're really taking ambition around circularity, framing it in something that you can achieve with a short, shorter time frame, and greening everyone against it. So I find that very inspiring, and I hope others will 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 look to IIPP um, for inspiration. Um, um, one last very quick comment, if I may. Um, I think it's really important, I mentioned before, that anything that we do is inclusive, that has a strong, strong lens of gender equity and inclusion. Sometimes it's hard to think about people when you think about circularity, but it's all about people. We created this mess, but I think we as people can come together um, and collaborate and also fix it. So I remain optimistic uh, for what we can do together. Right. Well, to use one of the words that Dakota used, justice um, needs to be baked into everything. So anti-racism, um, gender inclusive, and so on. There's so many ways for us to make sure to center people in the conversation. So Ms. Teixeira, before we give the floor back to Dakota and Aaron and to Chuk, um, last question is for you in this little section. What are two oh. ways that the leadership required for the circular economy is, is different from the kind of leadership that we see today. I think you really hinted at it in your earlier comments, <laughs> but if you want to punctuate that point, please feel welcome. Hi, thank you very much. I think that we mentioned before that I'm a passionate woman. I am. And uh, this is one concrete position for solutions. After the pandemic, uh, it's important to make people believe that we can tackle the global environmental crisis once we are, we, are, we are already facing climate and biodiverse crisis effects. It's very important to be passionate, okay, such that people can believe. But uh, uh, directly to your question, two important uh, uh, alternatives, two important ways to be observed. The first one, we need to act, 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 act based on common solutions. We must be together, not consider the difference, but based on common vision once we are interconnected by nature, as I mentioned before. And that's also, we need global solidarity. If you're not able to understand what global crisis demands, probably, and global solution demands, probably be very hard uh, to pay strategic to avoid that to avoid what the science is today uh, forecasting for us considering the global environmental crisis. So it's critical for us that we understand what must stay behind. Okay, what are the huge mistakes that we committed? Because based on our action, as mentioned before, you have a global environmental crisis. So we need to put the, the past, the, the mistakes from the past, and try to bring the future to the present. And second, we cannot forget that uh, economy play really plays really important role. So we need to understand the role of the economy markets like sustainable consumption production and sustainable choice for the consumers and how circularity will address or not the emerging carbon markets, for example. Okay, uh, I do believe that uh, circularity will allow civil society to power the transformation that we need to be done until 2050. So I think that we cannot forget also the role of circularity uh, to, to, to address the competitive advantage of emerging economies by 2050. It's very important to observe how transformative we need to do, but what you have to, how you have to act today 
not postponed for the future. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Well, to steal um, Chuk's title for the organization that he works, Future Ancestors, I'm going to hand the floor um, over to Dakota and Aaron. And we really want you to tuck into this conversation with some of the leaders that are joining us today and feel really welcome to pose the questions that you have. So the floor is now yours. Absolutely. Thank you. Um, Thank you, Catherine. I'll start by saying or asking, it's great to hear um, about everything that has been happening around the world. Our conversation so far has focused a lot on innovation and newness, but we haven't yet talked about how we'll live within planetary boundaries, providing a safe, flourishing and healthy life for nearly 8 billion diverse people around the world. Canada is one of the most culturally and ethnically diverse countries in the world, and we're still learning how to deepen our understanding and collaboration with these many peoples when we're making decisions that affect everyone. So my question is, what are you doing in your personal lives to deepen your understanding of circularity from different perspectives, and how has that influenced how you make decisions? Aha, the easy question. I see that you're putting to our leaders. Thank you so much for that, Dakota. We've got time for just a couple of answers. We'd like you to stay within one to two minutes. Who would like to respond first? Uh, um, uh, may I? I try. Please. May I? Okay, I think that uh, for me it is absolutely a big task. But uh, look, uh, as a consumer, I understand that I have to to adopt new choice or have new choice. So sustainable consumption production partners and also value chains traceability is critical for us. And a critical example here in Brazil, I don't buy anything from uh, deforestation, for example. Okay, this is a, my choice. Even if we have legal deforestation, the law allow us. I'm completely against this. So I also buy for indigenous people products to understand making how by economy will come into my quality of life. And these are based on my choice and also the opportunity that market offer to us to pay and also to to choice for better sustainable ways. This is based on circularity and this is based on the new relationship uh, with nature. I, I, I hope that I can help you on this. Thank you. Terrific. Minister Mujima Morea, would you, would, would you like to go next? Uh, th thank you very much. Can I again, uh, can, the, the, can Dakota repeat the question? Yes, Absolutely. of course. Yeah. So my question is, uh, what are you doing in your personal life to deepen your understanding of circularity from different perspectives? And how has that influenced how you make decisions? Oh, thank you very much. This is a very, uh, for me, simple question. Love it. Uh, to, to, be, to make sure that circularity starts by my home. I reuse, I repair, and I recycle whatever I have in my home. For example, when, when we talk about uh, waste, when I have food waste, I transform them into compost to be able to produce fertilizers for my kitchen garden. I don't throw it out. When I have my old shoes, old clothes, I repair. I don't throw it out. And I educate my neighbors to do the same. And I buy what I need not what I want, because those two are different. If we keep buying whatever we want, we are not being fair to secular economy. So those are the three, the reuse, the repair, and to recycle. When I have, for example, a, a plastic bottle uh, in, from which I, I finished uh, cooking oil, I don't throw it out. 
I plant vegetables in that bottle. It makes my kitchen garden grow, grow and grow without throwing the plastic bottle uh, out of my house. So I, I reuse everything and I involve my young children to do the same, to buy what they need, not what they want. That, that is how I do in my daily life. I thank you. Thank you. A, a woman after my own heart. I was joking earlier that instead of buying shoes, I went out and, and got old ones repaired. Just trying to make every small act count in some way toward a, living a more circular life. Thank you so much. Ms. Johnson, over to you for Dakota's question, and then we're going to turn to Aaron. Sure. Well, it's a great question. I think even the word consumer is the wrong word because when we consume a t-shirt, uh, we're not really consuming it. Uh, we're actually just using it and should pass it on to the next use. So I think like my fellow panelists, I try to minimize um, my purchases. Um, I actually participated uh, in a fundraiser a couple years ago for a UK charity where I wore the same six articles of clothing for six weeks and it was hard. <laughs> my co colleagues got, got a little bit tired of me wearing the same blazer day after day, but it was possible. Um, so, you know, I think these are small steps that make you aware of what it's what it's really like to reuse, recycle. Um, but I think more importantly, I'm a mother. I have two teenage boys. I've spent a lot of time with their schools, speaking to the classrooms about how important this is. And I think for me personally, it is important to get that message out and really help the youth um, that will be leading the world one day um, to understand that you know things are precious and everything has value, and we really need to rethink um, how we approach you know buying stuff versus um, using stuff and passing it on to the next use. Ms. Johnson, thank you so much. Erin, I'm going to hand things over to you now for your big question to the panelists. Great. Thanks so much, Catherine. You're welcome. So I wanted to pick up on the theme of new allies. The nature of leadership is changing and collaborative leadership is the only way forward with an increasingly complex and interconnected world. So I want to know, how do you ensure that your leadership is collaborative and who gets a seat at your table? Okay, let's turn to um, Ms. Tejera. Let's start with you on this one because let's start with a boom again um, in response to Aaron's question. Oh, it's not this question, but uh, I think that we have two points here very important to preserve. The first one is that we go into the world that we need to manage solutions. So, mention solutions means that we need to act. Act means that we need to come together, it needs to be collaborative. It's impossible to face global crisis or to tackle global crisis without global solutions. If my country takes decision to play very well, this is not enough. So we need to understand how we have this new platform, with new arrangements, political arrangements should come together. But don't forget it, that you have this transition in the world. And this environmental crisis means today that also there are geopolitical issues. This means that to have another adults into the room. We need another constituents that are coming. We need to know how to speak, to convince people, and to build based on not on a solution, but based on new realities. That what these realities are today. Do we have the global crisis today? Unfortunately, you have biodiversity law, water scarcity, and extreme uh, climate uh, uh, events happen. And this means that we need to convince people to come together. It's impossible to address uh, solutions without coming together. I learned this. I am the former minister for the environment, Brazil. I know what it means, how to tackle deforestation, how to go into these different ways to face the, the national reality. So I think that uh, your question is critical, but believe people want to be together. You need to convince them to come into the room. All of this. Okay. Thank you so much. Um, I believe we are out of time now as our panelists have given us such full and um, bold responses. I'd like to thank all of you for joining us today from around the world uh, to share in such a thoughtful and direct way your comments on the questions from Aaron and Dakota and from Chuk and I as well. We, we so appreciate your coming and being so forthcoming. So thanks to all of our participants. 
this morning, afternoon, evening, depending on where you're watching in the world. Un grand merci à toutes nos Thank you very much to all our speakers. Anstar, who leads the sustainability solutions team at the Finnish innovation fund Citra. So, uh, Teravi Timinen Mari. And also, we can't forget, this is the first Canadian to ever hit the WCEF stage, Scott Vaughan. Scott is the International Chief Advisor to the China Council for International Cooperation on Environment and Development. So, Mari, to you first. Uh, <laughs> Thank you, Catherine. And it is great to be here today. And Scott, so nice to see you again. So the first session has focused on leadership in a circular economy. And as we have heard from multiple voices during the session, leadership in a circular economy is a complex issue. So we know that there is no magic leader who could tell the whole world what each state, city, company and citizen must do to advance the circular economy. On the other hand, we also know that every project needs a leader and solving climate crisis and biodiversity loss is a very complicated and systemic project. So Scott, how do you see the role of leadership in a circular economy? Can we say who can and who should lead the transition? Great, thanks so much. Good evening. Um, Good afternoon, good evening, good morning, colleagues. I mean, first, just thanks so much. I mean, I'm really excited to be joining uh, this 2021 World Circular Economy Forum. And, you know, we'll, we'll define leaders within the circular economy by what we, what he or she are all doing um, as champions, as citizens, as consumers, um, to enable a, a change in how we uh, see the opportunities for circularity from around the world. And WCEF is really a tremendous chance to bring these practitioners together over the next three years. Um, in terms of leader, many thanks to you and your wonderful colleagues for CITRA, um, who have been uh, really champions on showing circular economy solutions uh, for many years. Also thank uh, uh, the Government of Canada, ECCC, and, and every, all their work in leading and hosting uh, this this uh, meeting uh, in 2021. I think as we just heard from this first really great panel, circular economy is really changing our definition of leadership. And, and we're seeing this now in terms of, somebody said, in terms of an enabling environment where we actually listen to one another around a circle in a spirit of trust, in a spirit of openness, uh, in a spirit of, of willing to be able to connect uh, to be able to bring uh, joint uh, solutions to problems, to finding new and third ways uh, in a way that listens to our Indigenous elders and, and puts equity, uh, gender equity uh, and, and, and justice at the center. I mean, one of the important areas um, uh, of, of looking at leadership within this circle is the role of public policy. And I, I just wanted to give two very, very quick examples. And, and the Minister of Rwanda just spoke about it eloquently. And the first one is just the, the things we buy. Uh, in July, the Biden administration uh, issued an, an executive order uh, that includes right to repair um, directive. Um, similar initiatives, we know they're underway, European Union, uh, in your country, Marie, in France and elsewhere. And it's enabling consumers uh, to move to reusing, refurbishing and repairing their products. Um, we're already seeing this at the grassroots level. There's uh, repair cafes around the world and they, they're expanding. They've largely been focusing on household appliances, clothes, textiles, uh, machines, tools. But I think this is an example of really opening this up to a new frontier in terms of electronic waste. And, and we know there's millions of tons that are produced annually, and this can actually make a real difference. And the second very brief example I wanted to give is the houses and the homes we live. Uh, Portland, Oregon has issued an ordinance, which is to say rather than demolishing old homes, uh, renovate them uh, and refit them uh, in order to lower the carbon footprint, uh, make them more efficient, uh, and make them more accessible. And I think those are two examples of just the type of innovation that we're seeing. Thanks, Marie. Thank you, Scott. 
And I also believe that we all must take the responsibility for leadership within the resources and scope of influence that we have, because in a democracy we all have to contribute. And also, actually, all changes start from the smallest decision making you need, and that is us individuals. And citizens, they actually have a huge power because we can choose our decision makers and we can create a market for circular solutions if we want. And then we can of course also destroy a market if we collectively choose not to buy something. And then the companies, they play a vital role because they are the solution providers. And companies have huge circular opportunities waiting for them out there. And those markets are counted in trillions. But still, I believe that the biggest responsibility belongs to those who have most power. And that are the members of the governments and parliaments, business leaders, city mayors and all leaders. And I would really like to ask all government ministers and business leaders across the world. Please take messages from the scientific community extremely seriously and update the plans in your countries and also in your companies so that we can meet the 1.5 degrees climate target and halt the biodiversity loss. Now it is really not time to think what can be easily done but what must be done and then do it. Marie, thank you. Thanks very much. I mean, I mean, it's really we're at this pivot point, as many have said, including Ayako Ishii, uh, and that is this the transformation, for example, in subsidies is beginning finally after 20 years, uh, moving into the Glasgow COP summit um, in a couple of weeks. Uh, we're seeing commitments, 15,000 companies. Uh, 1,500 companies, 15,000 cities, universities, and others, uh, but we still have big gaps. And so how do you see um, scaling circular economy more widely into our practices and society? Thank you, Scott. That is a very important question. So the good news is that the science says that these ecological challenges are still solvable by humans. Also technically, we have almost all the solutions that we need. And economically, we would have the financial means if we, for example, redirect the environmentally harmful subsidies to useful and regenerative subsidies. So what we urgently need, in my mind, is the political leadership. And we need that political leadership also outside the circular economy bubble. And in my mind, we already have almost all the allies that we need. Citizens and especially all leaders should show example and leadership also in their own lives. There is no better way of increasing understanding and demonstrating leadership and credibility than personally making sustainable choices, that, thus setting an example. And that is a very good way to scale up the solutions. And I really love how Mahatma Gandhi has said this, be the change you wish to see in the world. And I have a final question to you, Scott. So what do you think? Why do we act right now? I mean, I think this will be one of the key themes over the next three days of the World Circular Economy. At this moment in 2021, literally around the world, we've seen now the effects of climate change in North America, in Europe, in China. This is no longer a, a longer term threat. It's affecting millions of people uh, every year and it's growing. The next couple of months offer a really a once in a generation opportunity in Kunming, in Glasgow, as you've said, to put forward a bold, ambitious agenda of transformation at scale, which brings together uh, into an equitable, carbon neutral, and nature positive agenda. And we won't be able to get there without circular economy solutions and driving transformation. Thank you, Scott, for discussing with me today. It was a great pleasure. And unfortunately, we are running out of time, not only in front of the ecological sustainability challenges, but also this discussion. So back to you, Catherine and Chuk.
Thank you so much, Mari, and thank you, Scott, as well. Uh, it's just terrific to be able to lean into some of these conversations and pay attention to the kind of language people are using. Uh, lots of discussion underway in the chat, as Chuk was just pointing out, uh, people putting in notes and resources, commenting on the way that this conversation is unfolding already. Kitos, Mari, et merci beaucoup, Scott. Thanks very much, Mary and Scott. Uh, so these have been very uh, interesting conversations, uh, but uh, too short. Uh, that's why we've uh, uh, planned more than 20 accelerator uh, sessions on uh, Wednesday, during which you'll be able to go deeper into uh, individual issues, subjects uh, uh, that we have not been able to deal with, deal with in the two first days. Uh, each uh, accelerator session will be organized by one of our wonderful partners and collaborators for the forum. I would uh, ask you to look into what is available and clicking on the tab for the program link to take you to the accelerator sessions. They're, they're the ones that are going to be most closely related to the conversations that we've just had. And if you're looking to have great conversations, you can follow up, as mentioned, with the audience members um, going into the networking hub. You can share resources, comment on different things, um, and watch the team. The CEF 2021 team is posting resources and great information in there for you to use throughout these sessions. Donc, vous so, uh, take advantage of the virtual uh, resources available on uh, the circular economy throughout the world.